In this video, I'm going to be developing a script that was started in part one. So I have this script here called lesson one. And let me just remind you what the script does. It gives me a graph of oxy versus runtime. And I can also click the link for histograms and view the histograms for those two columns. What I want to do in today's session is to make this script more flexible so that I don't want to have this X variable hard coded. I want the user to be able to choose what to put onto the X axis. And that will also impact what appears in the uh, histogram here. So let's look at how we're going to do that. The first thing is to make explicit that we don't want to have hard coded names for these columns. So when I have oxy, I want to have um, a Y column. And when I have runtime, I want to have an X column. And those columns are going to be passed into my function. So my function is going to have a Y column and an X column. And that means when I call my graph, I have to provide these names. So here, I need to have a Y col name and an X col name. Now I could just call those Y col and X col, but I just want to make explicit the, the idea that these variables are different to these variables. They get mapped onto them when you, you call the function. So for now, I'm just going to say Y column name is equal to oxy. and the X column name at the moment is going to be runtime and we will change this to be user defined. But currently then I've got my Y column name is oxy, X column name runtime. Those get passed into this function. They get mapped onto these names which are then used in here. Now that's all fine. Um, but there's one complication associated with the jump, which is the order in which it passes uh, JSL statements. So what would happen if I run this? Jump will come along and try and create graph builder before it's evaluated the contents of this thing and this thing. And I need to override that default behavior by saying, you need to explicitly evaluate this column before, or this variable, before you try and create a graph of it. And that will fix one of the problematic areas of, of JSL. So let's now run this and just verify that that still works. And just to emphasize the fact, if I were to, let's take this off, just to show we are using variables and not hard coded information. This will fail now if I run this. Um, it's not put anything on, on the y-axis. It's not evaluated this thing correctly. So I do need that eval to go in there. Now I need to do the same for the my histogram. So we're going to have a y column and an x column. And then this can be, we want to evaluate the y column. And I want to evaluate the X column, like so. And let's just run this and confirm that that works correctly. So my histogram has two parameters, but zero arguments were supplied. Okay, so these were the two uh, parameters that are defined as part of the definition of histograms. But when I call my histograms, I've forgotten that I need to provide this list of arguments. So uh, when I call my histograms, I need Y column name and X column name. So that looks good. So the next thing is we've done a lot of the hard work there. Uh, what we need to do, though, is allow the user to define or select the, the column. So I want to prototype this code. And so I think it's useful practice just to prototype code in a separate script window. So um, conceptually, I'm going to build this up step by step, but conceptually we're going to have a list and this list will be the list of column names. 
but let's just for now just say ABC and I'm going to have a window and I'm going to ask the user to select something uh, I'm going to have a list box which displays that list so that's the basics of what I want and that displays a window with a list a selectable a list of selectable items um, let's tidy this up let's put a border around that So that's better and some type of prompt. So before the list box, some text, uh, select the predictor variable. Let's make that style to be bold. Make sure your brackets, you've got the right number of brackets. So the last bracket closes the text box and then we've got a comma and we'll probably need a bit of spacing between the text and the list box size. Is it six pixels there? Now a border box can only contain one thing and we now have three things. So those three things I want to organize vertically into a V list box. Like so. So that looks good. Maybe I don't need so much space at the top, maybe just 10 at the top. Select the predictor variable. Like so, OK, so now let's focus on the interaction with this window. Um, I've got a list box, I'll call it LB. And I can send a message to LB, get selected. And if I right click, I can put on embedded log. And whatever is selected, uh, I'm going to store in a variable called cell and I'm going to show cell and you'll see what happens here. Two things happen. It says for well, cell. Well, these curly brackets are a list. It's an empty list, not what I was expecting. And then it's displayed this, but it actually put this in the log before the window appeared or it looked like it but certainly before I had a chance to make a selection and if I make a selection now well uh, what it's showing is this got executed before I clicked one of these items and I need to stop that happening I need to say I don't want to do this until I've done this and we do that by making this into a so-called modal window now if I run there's nothing appeared in the log this has appeared and jump has also put an OK button on and I make a selection and then I click OK and now it tells me I've got a selected value. Now notice it's a list because actually I can select multiple items. So what I want to do is to uh, say that my X call name is equal to the first item of the list and I want to show X call name. So now X call is A. If I didn't do that, it would be A in curly brackets and we just want the item, not, not the list. Now that's going to be a problem if I don't select anything. Uh, and in fact, if I don't select anything, then I don't want to continue. So I want to make sure something has been selected. So what I can say is if the number of items in cell is equal to zero, then I can throw. Throw is just a way of aborting execution. So if I do this and just cancel, for example, then, oh, okay, that's a separate issue. Um, I will, I'm gonna to have to address that in a moment. So let's make a selection. Uh, that's fine because that condition isn't satisfied. I'm going to need to ad address that error. So um, this error, if I just do a cancel or even I just click OK, I get deleted object reference LB 
and what's going on. Well, this code as it stands is something that kind of works. It works if you use the code correctly, but it can sometimes not work. So this is bad practice. So we wrote this code before I had a modal window. With a modal window, what happens? Well, once we close the window, all the contents are no longer defined. And so LB technically is not defined. And whether we can reference it or not uh, is theoretically, we should never be able to reference it. Uh, the way we deal with that is we reference it inside the window so we can detect an on close event. So when the window is closing, and, but before it's closed inside the window, we can say that, oops, I'm just gonna copy, copy uh, this line. So we want to have the selection and I can then say X coal. Well, no, I'm just going to I'm just going to create the selection. So this is making a reference to the selection. So I'm getting whatever's been selected on the list box. I'm not going to ask about what was selected or if anything was selected. I'm just grabbing the details of the selection so that now once I've finished the window, I no longer need to do that. But but I can still once the window has closed, I can say, um, did we get any items? If not, we're going to throw an error message. And if we did, then we're going to grab the first item. So now if I run this and I cancel, it just aborts. If I select something, then it shows me what's been selected. The throw, technically, it raises an exception and I could say oops. And what happens then is you get cancel and oops appears. But I just want to do this quietly. I don't want a a message. So that's everything working except for the fact that we don't want to have ABC. What I want to do is have this as a list of column names. So I can first of all get a reference to the current data table and then from that table I can get the column names which by default come as a collection of objects and I just want the, the string names associated with them. So let me just um, store those names in list and let me just confirm, uh, show you that that works correctly if I show list. So there's a list of the column names. If I didn't put string in, you end up with a list of things that look like the names, but they're not in quotes, so they're not physical strings. So I'm going to undo and just put that back in. So now I can run and now my list is a list of column names. That's perfect, almost perfect. If we really want to get pedantic, uh, we don't want to include oxy in this list because oxy is the, the Y variable in our analysis. Now, unfortunately, I can't say remove oxy from this, this list. I can say remove the fifth item. So I have to then know it's the fifth item. So I have to do two things, find out which what the position is and then remove that position from the list. So um, for, I'm going to say y column name is equal to oxy. That's going to be, that's information that actually comes from my, my main script, but I'm just going to put it in here for test purposes. And then once I've got the list, what I can do is use the function contains. And what contains does is allows me to ask whether or not this list contains Y column name, which is oxy. Well, I know it does, but what it does is to give me the position. So it returns the position. And so then what I can do is I can remove from the list whatever was in that position. Now my list doesn't include oxy. Okay, I don't need the show and I don't need this because that's already defined in my main script. So this is my main script 
And what we are trying to do is just define X column name. Instead of having a single line to do that, we've got X column name defined here based on all of this code. So I'm going to copy that code and replace it in here. Maybe just uh, take that out. OK. Let's make sure this works correctly. So I run my script. It asks me to select the predictor variable. I'm going to choose runtime. And it gives me a graph of oxy versus runtime. And I do a histogram and I get oxy versus runtime. And just to double check, if I choose something else, max pulse, I get the appropriate graph and I get the appropriate distribution. So that is all working perfectly. One final thing we need to do with this is just to save the script. OK, so there we are. That's the end of today's session. We will do an additional session. There'll be a part three in which we take this script. And when we if I just show you this output, we're going to have additional buttons here. So we're going to start adding additional analysis options to the script. So please join me for that. If you like this video, please uh, click the like button below. And if you want to see similar videos and be reminded about them, please subscribe to the channel. All the best and bye for now.